Thank you, Danny. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> Philadelphia. When you hear that name, that city, what do you think about? Someone just start singing the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air theme song. I almost came down the aisle singing it, but I chose not to. What else what you might think of, though? You, you certainly probably don't think of a church in Turkey 2,000 years ago. Maybe you think about some of our nation's history, the Liberty Bell, uh, the Liberty Bank. Oh, wait, that's not really a bank, is it? What is that building? History teachers? You guys don't know? Good job. <laughs> so Independence the, Hall. The what? Independence Hall. Independence Hall. Yeah, that's right. Good job. I want to make sure you do. And of course, uh, the Liberty Bell. But maybe you don't go that route. I knew there was some that definitely would. Uh, what else? What else do I have up there you might think of? For the, oh, of course, Rocky. Maybe you think of that victory. Uh, maybe not the most lovable city to their sports teams. If you know anything about sports, you know that. They are notoriously big booers. If you mess up, they will boo you in a heartbeat. What else? This is what I think of. Oh, yeah. Philly cheesesteaks. <laughs> See, I already got started talking about Olive Garden before. Don't forget to sign up. Now I'm thinking about Philly cheesesteaks, and I think that I'm going to Subway today. I think I just decided. <clears throat> but again, that's the wrong Philadelphia. Maybe you think of the word brotherly love. Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Now, of course, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, United States of America, we call it the city of brotherly love, even though, like I said, they oftentimes are known for being the harsh of each other. Uh, but that name didn't originate with the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The original Philadelphia, which was also the city of brotherly love, it was over in Turkey, and it was in that area that we've been talking about um, of the seven churches. Now, the reason why it was called <laughs> the city of brotherly love, because Philadelphos means brotherly love or brotherly. The reason why it was called Philadelphos was because uh, the king there, Atelus II, loved his brother so very much. He was loyal to him. And his brother was his predecessor king, uh, Emenes. And Emenes named the city Philadelphia, which was the name that he had given his brother, Attilus, who would be Attilus II, the king of this particular city, the leader of this particular city. These two had such a strong bond that this name stuck. Now, through all the different changes that happened in that city, for hundreds of years before this letter was written, uh, it would be changed to different names. When, when uh, Alexander the Great would be in power, it would be called something different. When Rome would be in power, it would be called something different. It would always be to honor a different god or a different leader. But the people of the city and the people of the area still called it Philadelphia. There's places like that everywhere you go. Or maybe names have changed. But we still call it what we're used to calling it. Uh, you know, when I, took, when I moved here, it took me a while to realize that Bob's was actually IGA. Right? Everybody knows what I'm talking about there, for sure. And there's a number of other things like that. That's what it will probably always be called to many of us. It didn't take long before me and Amy were saying, we're going to vote to Bob's. Forget the IGA part. Right? So Philadelphia was the name that they would stick to. They had many false gods there, like all the other cities. They had the Greek gods of Olympus. They were known for cultivating grapes and making wine. However, uh, here's, the, here's the big thing I want you to take home with you today about this city. Remember what we talked about with Sardis last week. What happened in 17 AD? A major earthquake that shook the city. Um, they had to move the city, in fact. Well, that earthquake didn't just affect that one location infected the entire area and the city of Philadelphia was basically leveled because of this major earthquake. The difference was because of where Philadelphia set on the fault line, they experienced harsh aftershocks more than any other local city for years afterwards, the largest being in 23 AD. So it had a lot of instability. The aftershocks were, were, were daily. Uh, reports say, and the buildings were in damage, and they couldn't be repaired. 
Because of this, many lived in huts outside of the city. They would only go back into the city when they had absolutely had to get something that maybe they'd left behind. And because of this, there's going to be a lot of looters, a lot of thieves. People were afraid they're going to lose their stuff that was still stuck in the city, maybe in rubble or maybe in a building with a big crack in it that they might have been afraid to go in. Now, I want, I want to ask you this because this is going to make more sense to you if you can answer yes to this question. But honestly, I hope that you can't answer yes to this question. Has anybody ever been in an earthquake? It is not fun. I've not been in any major earthquakes. I can remember when we lived in Los Angeles, California, waking up in the middle of the night one night, and there was a rumble. I was lucky that it was early enough, not a 1995 earthquake, that it was no big deal. And whenever we asked some friends the next day, they're like, ah, it's just an earthquake, no big deal. Then maybe they'd grown, grown accustomed to it. And I remember another time, even more recently, when there was an earthquake in Virginia. And I was sitting in the office at Latonia Christian Church, and I thought a truck drove by. A big semi-truck would come by, that old church, it would rattle a little bit. And all of a sudden, my dad comes running in my office and says, did you feel that? Was there an earthquake? I was like, ah, nah, dad, it was just a truck driving by. Just a truck. A big semi-truck drove by just a second ago, I think I heard him shifting gears. Well, not too long after that, we found out that there had been this earthquake in Virginia that was felt all the way to the Mississippi River. Maybe you experienced that. But even with those times, this was nothing major in my own personal life to where I really felt like I was in danger or the buildings might collapse. But that's how the people of Philadelphia were living. Now, as we get into this letter, let's take note that nothing bad is said by Jesus about this church. He will call them loyal city of brotherly love after all. He's going to talk about open doors. Now those could be missions, those could be opportunities that they have, and, or it could just be the fact that Christ opens a door for each and every single one of us to God, to eternal life, to forgiveness. And without Christ opening that door, it could not be opened. We'll be in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17 through 13 today. Let's start off by saying, who he is. Every letter that we've gone through so far, Christ is going to start off by saying, this is who I am. I'm God. First, let's look at the verse. Just verse 7 right now. It says, this is the message from the one who is holy and true. The one who has the key of David. What he opens, no one can close. And what he closes, no one can open. And four things that he says right there that I want to point out about identifying who he is. Four identity traits, if you will. The first thing is when he said he was holy. The one who was holy. Oh, what does this mean? Set apart. Christ is different than us. He is truly holy. Isaiah 6.3. We know this. We, we, this is in so many psalms. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Those words never get old. Because without the holiness of Jesus Christ, we're lost. He identifies himself as the one who is holy. Not only that, but again, he's going to quote scripture here. And he'll do it again later. The next we find out of the four traits, he's not only holy, but he's true. He's genuine. He's the real deal. This isn't some false god who lives on some imaginary mountain called Olympus. This isn't some god who is maybe in control of some other gods or who has one responsibility to make sure that the ocean or that the factories or, or that the whatever. This is the genuine Son of God, the Savior, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. This is, he is true in what he says and he, in true, he is true in who he is. Not an imitation. In word and in being. Genuinely God. The next is when he says the king of David. Now Philadelphia, we believe, had a very strong hold on the Jewish community. Uh, the Jewish community was, was large in this particular city. Uh, still had the synagogue, which we'll talk about in a minute. So when Christ says, I hold the key of David, this is something that is very important to them. This is something that is very important to all of the Jews who had converted to Christianity and to anyone who was Jewish. David was their guy. This was their hero. This was the God who had destroyed Goliath, who had risen Israel to prominence, and they, they quite honestly probably put too much onto David, who, like all of us, was just a flawed individual that was lost without the Lord. But this key of David is going to say authority. 
We know that all authority on heaven and earth was given to Christ. This is his way of making sure they understood who he was, who he is. The only one that can open the door. He's the only one with the authority to do it. He's the only one that can say, I got a way for you to get to God. The way, the truth, and the life. Now, again, I said he was quoting scripture. The Jews understand this. They understand this passage of scripture because it is a direct quote from Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22. And as they would read this letter, they would know this right away. Right away. Now, they might not know it was chapter 22, verse 22. That's going to come much later in history. They're going to know those words from the scripture, from the Bible. And the fourth trait, he's the one that opens and shuts. He's the only one with the authority to do that. That is power. He can remove obstacles in your life. He can make things so much easier on us if we only put our hope and our trust and our faith in Him. So I have to ask you, are you doing that? Are you really relying on Jesus Christ in your life every single day? Now listen, we can all do more. Every single one of us. If you just answered, yeah, I am, Brother Mikey, all the way. Come on. We can all do better with this. We must learn to trust Him more. We must learn to be more obedient. It is so easy for us to start thinking about me. 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 Now, I'm saying me. You all should be saying me. Us as individuals. We become selfish human beings. Here, Christ is telling us that He is the one that is holy, that is true, that holds the key, that has the power to open and shut doors for us. Here He is saying, He is the one who we must rely on in our lives. So that's who He is. What about what He is? Or maybe more importantly, what will He do? We know that He is God. Now what will He do? Uh, chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. I know all the things you do. Now, He says that every letter, doesn't He? Let's remember, Christ knows everything we do. Everything, even the stuff that we wish He didn't know. I know all the things you do, and I have opened a door for you that no one can close. You have little strength, yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. Look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogue, those liars who say they are Jews but are not, to come and bow down at your feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones I love. Because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. Now maybe you can say it's a little bit of an attack on this Jewish culture, this Jewish group that's there. But really, at this point in history, we've got to realize that the only way to reconnect with God was through Jesus Christ. The Jews, the synagogues, the, thing they, the things that they had learned for centuries upon centuries, it all led to Jesus. And now He had come, and they had killed Him, and He paid the ultimate price, the, the, the sacrifice for us, and He had risen from the dead. See, God's chosen people were no longer the Jews. God's chosen people were those who put their hope, their faith, and their trust in Jesus Christ. And if we do that, we too are God's chosen people. What else does Scripture say? He says that He opened a door. And again, maybe, what, what was this? That opened that door to heaven? Yeah, I think that's part of it. But I also think that this was an opportunity. An opportunity that this church in Philadelphia had. And they knew what it was. When they read this letter, I believe that they knew right away, here's what Christ is talking about. Here's what He means. Some think that this was an opportunity because of where it's set to spread the word of Christ throughout the Eastern world. Some think that it may have been something else, just a unique opportunity. But I think that they knew, and I think that the churches around them knew what kind of opportunity they had. See, all churches, all church leaders, all preachers, we should strive to know, all Christians, we should strive to know what opportunities that we have to spread the word of Christ. So just like that church of Philadelphia may have been looking, looking at specific needs, let me ask you, what needs are here? What, what needs do we have here in Ohio County, in Hartford, in Hartford Christian Church? 
What needs do we have that we can do better at with fulfilling? What opportunities do we have to reach people for Christ? i got a couple ideas. I've mentioned a few of these before. I would love to have a van service on Sunday morning. Now, a few of you might have said something to me before about that. It's time to get it up and running. The guys are going to check with some of the kids on Wednesday night this week and ask them, do you want to come back to church on Sunday morning? They'll have to have a signed paper. But if they want to be here, why aren't we getting them here? Because some of them do. Some of them do. There is opportunity out there to pick people up who don't have a ride. I need your help. I need your help. I can't keep putting it on the same van drivers all the time. I can't keep putting it on the same guy. I need more help with this. Someone that's going to be able to get up here at 8.30 on Sunday morning, have a helper, and go out and get some folks that want to come to church and bring them in. And look, it might start small, but it's a program that I think that we should have up and running by now. I need your help. That's a need that we have, an opportunity that we have. The next one, home communion. We've got two guys doing home communion right now. They're working their tails off for us, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. It's time to have some things change with this. This can be an after-church program. I do not want anybody to miss Sunday morning worship service. That is just not the way we should do things. But I also don't want to put it on these two guys where they have to go to all of our home communion department after church. They shouldn't have to do that. Let's have some couples. Let's have some families. Let's have some people. Maybe you just stop and see one person that's on our list. Maybe you just stop at one location. But I need some of you to step up. Because this is something that we could do better. That's some needs that are here. And maybe you thought of some more. The fact is, maybe it's just an opportunity for you to go to your next door neighbor and say, hey, the church has collected pop tabs. Here's why. Bring your pop tabs up. We're trying to be active here. We're trying to be that church, like we talked about last week, that not just seems alive, or not just thinks we're alive, but that is alive because we have our priorities straight. We have our purpose in order. And that is to tell people about Jesus and live that Christian lives ourselves. I need an amen. amen. And I also need you to step up. What else does he say here? He talks about opposition. Opposition to the church. Humble. Because what is going to happen with opposition when the church is doing what the church is supposed to do? Not just Hartford Christian Church. We're talking about the kingdom. What are the critics going to be? They're going to be humble. Israel was humble. They had to be. And think about every Jewish person who had really tried their hardest to hold to that law, who had to be humbled when they realized that they couldn't do it and they had to only be able to, the only way was for them to seek Jesus. That would have been some humility. That was them losing that chosen people status. See, the new church, the new chosen people, talk about the new Israel. See, God, the church is the new Israel. Us, the congregations, the people who believe in Jesus. Israel was God's chosen people. They were the children of Jacob. Like we've been talking about on Wednesday nights. Now we are his adopted children. His new Israel. And the opposition will be humbled when we obediently follow him. Christ also mentions the hour of trial. He's going to be protective of us. If we're following him. If we're persevering like he's asked us to. Now listen. We need Him every hour, like the old hymn goes. Every single hour of every single day. It's easy for us to forget that, though, sometimes, isn't it? When things are going our way. When things are going exactly the way we want them, it's easy for us to forget that. But in our times of need, that's when we're seeking Him most. Now listen, we need to seek Him out every day, every hour, every minute, every opportunity that we possibly can. That, that goes without saying. We all know that. But I can tell you, it's in those difficult days, in those days where I struggle, in those days whenever I, uh, I'm sad, that's whenever I know that I need Christ closer than ever. That's whenever I want to grab onto Him and say, Lord, please don't let me go. That hour of trial. That hour of trial. We experience it probably more than we realize. I say turn to Jesus for this. Let's read the next part of the scripture. When he comes. Who he is, what he's going to do, and when he comes. Now listen, that's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. Revelation chapter 3, verse 11 through 12. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have, so that no one will take away your crown. 
All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God. Now, wait a minute, Ryan. That, look at those words there. Remember the earthquakes? All right, go on. Thank you. Uh, and they will never have to leave it. And I will write on them the name of my God. And they will be citizens in the city of my God. The new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. He mentions the crown of life. That's a blessing, folks. That's the blessing that He has bestowed on us when we follow Him. Victory. Man, you all know I love that word. That victory that we have. When we persevere. When we trust and hope. And continue to follow Him. See, this crown of life is something that we get with effort. With great continual effort. By being obedient. And it's something that we've got to hold on tight to. We can't let the looters come in and take it. We can't leave it unguarded in the city that might be in, in ruins. We've got to hold on to our faith as tight as we can every single day, every single hour. That's why we need Him every hour. Hold on to your faith, your Christianity, securely. How are you going to do that? Don't forget to pray. Don't forget to read His Word. Don't forget to be consistent in your church attendance. We talked about this morning, and David, you nailed it. Man, one of the most strengthening things that you can have is the fellowship that we experience every time we get together. I look forward to it. I look forward to it. To knowing that there's encouragement here for each other. That yes, you can follow Christ. And yes, we can lean on each other. But in the meantime, we're all leaning on Christ. What else do they say? Pillar. Something that's going to mean a lot to these people who have this city that's having earthquakes every single day. A pillar is going to mean dependable, true, and honor. And the pillars in the church will never fail. Never fail. They will never fall. He talks about the new name, the new city. Let's look at these three things. God, he says, to whom we belong. The new city where we have citizenship through Christ Jesus our Lord and the Savior, Christ's name. His new name, we all have talked, we've talked about before. The fact is, to me, He's the Savior. Now, what about you? Can you put your hope, your confidence, your faith, your trust? Do you rely only on Jesus? Is Jesus truly your Savior? Folks, if not, it's time to be. He's going to be a pillar for us that will never break down. So I ask you then, where are you? Where are you in your faith right now? We live in a fallen world. We live in a shaky, fallen, crumbling world. I wrote down a whole bunch of synonyms for that. But that's true of where we're at right now. And the fact is, folks, Christ is our only solid ground. And we must stand fast on Him. We have fears, uncertainties, and unknowns in our lives every single day. We have hours of need, hours of trial every single day. But we have a brother in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who loves us. Who is loyal to us, who is dependable and true. So now let's honor him. Revelation 3 13. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. So I'll ask you this the door's open, the opportunity's there. Christ is telling us to take advantage of it. Are you listening? Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, that you will help us to have those ears to hear, to listen to your word, to be obedient to you, and to take advantage of the opportunities that you have given us. Lord, thank you for opening those doors. And we know, Lord, that there are some doors that you have opened that we've been slow to walk through. Lord, help us to pick up the pace with our sense of urgency. Not just to get people in here to have higher numbers, but to get people in here so that they can have a relationship with you. 
Meanwhile, Lord, we ask that you will help us to grow stronger in our relationship with you, knowing that you're our Savior and also our friend. We thank you so very much. In the name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. We have our hymn of opportunity. Here's an opportunity. A door is opening for you right now. If today is the day that you want to give your life to Jesus, to repent, to turn to Him, please do not hesitate to walk down this aisle and accept Him right now. Right now. Well, don't wait. And that hour is coming soon. And that is something that we know for a fact. Take advantage of the opportunity today. Would you all please stand as we sing? Christian Church. 